The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, and he did not deny it. But he confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. They said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, and the pro- as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands the one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to start today with with what may be, or I guess at least what I think, is the, the central question of this Advent season. And it's a bit of a personal question, actually. Where is your hope? I am guessing I am not the only one here who looks at each day's news anymore with uh, not so much alarm as with exhaustion. I, I, I think it was alarm a while back, but by now my reaction to the war in the Holy Land in Ukraine and unconscionable national debt and a degrading planet and record high murders in Kansas City and the political circus that occupies our Cathedral of Democracy in Washington. My, my, my reaction to all this sadly isn't outrage anymore, but more shaking my head. And I think that's because we can't function in a constant state of alarm even if it's the case that that alarm is warranted. I mean, we're just not wired that way. If, if every day we, we see our people and our politics and our planet on fire, at, at some point we just find ourselves wondering what can we do but watch it burn. And meanwhile, Advent flickers before us like a holy flame, persistently asking, Where is your hope? Because through this season, God whispers insistently that neither alarm nor exhaustion are the paradigms for God's world. Instead, I think God has a better plan. And today, like last week, to get us ready for a redeemed world, God brings us the patron saint of strangeness, John the Baptist. John John is both a preacher's conundrum and delight because for 2,000 years now, we have never really been able to wrap our minds around him, I don't think. I mean, even the gospel accounts of John the Baptist don't speak with a common voice. In In the synoptic gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, we get... John the hairy wild man, you know, the the baptizer who needs a bath. (laughs) In fact, in the series, The Chosen, he's described as creepy John, someone even the soon-to-be disciples kind of want to avoid. So this John the Baptist sticks it to the man, castigating both religious and Roman authorities for exploiting people in poverty and powerlessness. Bear fruit worthy of repentance, this John cries out, because even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, he says. The Savior is coming with his winnowing fork in his hand, creepy John tells us. And those who don't meet the standards of God's reign and rule will find themselves facing unquenchable fire. 
Then on the other hand, we have John the Baptist in the fourth gospel, who we heard today. This John is much more controlled, but also much less clear. He's introduced as a man sent from God, as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. Now, he himself was not the light, the gospel writer quickly says, but, but he came to testify to the light. So in this account, there's no creepy John leading a mob in the desert. You know, here John the Baptist is calm and cool and collected, more a TED Talk idea generator than a prophet with a bullhorn. But still, this John is a threat to the religious authorities who come asking just who he is and what he thinks he's doing. So TED Talk John answers by refusing to meet the authorities' expectations. Are you the Messiah, they ask? Nope. <laughs> what, what are you then? Elijah, the, the Old Testament miracle worker and killer of the priests of other gods, who many thought would be returning as a harbinger of the day of the Lord. Nope. Not Elijah, John says. So are you the prophet? The, the, the new Moses, others thought, would herald God's coming victory over Israel's oppressors. Nope, John says. Well, the authorities demand, then who are you? <laughs> Indeed, who is this guy? <laughs> and what does he represent then and now? Well, the, the preaching purists would say that I shouldn't conflate these different gospel accounts. But, but I think it makes sense in the case of John the Baptist. Because whether you see John as the rebel with the bullhorn sticking it to the man, or whether you see John as the TED Talk speaker silencing the critics who aren't as smart as he is, both Johns are saying this. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And along that straight path is coming one you do not know, the king whom the world won't recognize, the one who will save us from oppression and fear and unholy misrule, not by crushing the power structure, but by transforming it from the bottom up, from the inside out one heart at a time. So at least to me, if ever there were a biblical figure for our time, it's John the Baptist. Whether you see him leading a mob in the streets or giving a TED talk, John's message for us is consistent. That yes, our people and our politics and our planet are on fire. And that's not okay. In fact, it's evil. And buying into it is sinful. When we don't care enough about our children to take both national debt and climate change seriously, when we tiptoe around the killing of 19,000 people so far in Palestine because we think one horror deserves another, when we see folks wandering our streets as annoyances to be moved along rather than people needing mental health care and affordable places to live, when we watch all this and just shake our heads, both Creepy John and Ted Talk John look at us and say, you might want to rethink that. Because after all, the reign and rule of God is close at hand. So can we really do anything about problems like these? Well, if you accept the premise that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ came to transform hearts that would then transform the world, well, in that case, we can absolutely do something about problems like these. It's the prophetic butterfly effect. You know about the butterfly effect, right? It's a, a scientific metaphor of the interconnectedness of life on our planet that the fluttering of a butterfly's wings on one continent affects one tiny change after another, eventually causing storms continents away. Okay, I, I don't know anything about climatology, but, but I do know the baffling way that God chooses to work. And it's very much a butterfly effect kind of thing. You know, seven days and a few hours from now on Christmas Eve, 
we're going to celebrate the astonishing fact that the sovereign of the universe chose to bridge the gap between us by coming to be one of us, redirecting history by being born into poverty and oppression and a backwater of a tyrannical empire. And inhabiting that world for 33 years or so, God changed the heart of one individual after another, leaving the world forever changed. And millions of us forever look into the future with crazy hope. So yes, Jesus says, the world is on fire. And it's been on fire for a long, long time now. And that is not good. But it's also not the end of the story. So back to the question I started with. Where is your hope? I think your hope is to be next in line for the butterfly effect of the world's salvation. And you can do that by being exactly what John the Baptist is in today's reading, a witness. John the Baptist came as a witness to testify to the light, light that the darkness cannot overcome, by the way, so that all might believe through him. So John isn't changing the world in a flash through his own power. John just points to what he knows and who he knows, reporting God's truth about this world we're blessed to inhabit. He says the oppressive forces around you actually aren't in control. Turns out God is. Okay, say the regular folks in the crowd, what are we supposed to do? Well, John says, it's not enough to assume that you're on the right team. You got to act. Share your food and clothing with people who don't have enough. Okay, so what should we do? Ask the tax collectors and the soldiers. Well, you got to change how you act, John says. Stop exploiting people who have less power than you do just because the system lets you get away with it. Well... Why should we, they ask. <laughs> because, John says, as he channels the prophet Isaiah, because the reign and rule of God is about bringing good news to the oppressed and binding up the brokenhearted and freeing the captives and releasing the prisoners and forgiving impossible debts, which is what the year of the Lord's favor means, and meeting the needs of those suffering from their land's devastation. That's God's plan. It turns out, you and I get the chance every day to witness to that light. That light that the world's darkness cannot overcome. How? How does that happen? There are a million ways you can make that happen. But here's one idea. You can come back in seven days, in a few hours, and testify to God's dominion over our world through a very worldly action. So on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we'll gather to remember the stories of, of how God's light came to be. You know, not, not in blinding victory over the armies of the earth, but just flickering in a cave on a hillside. And we'll remember how that light sets our own hearts on fire turning Grinches and Scrooges into love's witnesses. And we'll then get the opportunity to flutter our own butterfly wings in a very outward and visible way. Because as we remember the Son of God who came as a child with nothing, we will give in order to change the lives of one child after another. Here's where I'm going with this. The gifts from our worship here on Christmas will go not to the church, but to children we serve. 300 kids at a school in rural Haiti, 100% of whose graduating class passed the national exam last year, by the way, as well as 43 families at Benjamin Banneker Elementary here in Kansas City who are pairing with 39 St. Andrews members and friends to put food on the table and get to know each other. 
Here that night in the candlelit brightness of our silent night, with each gift that we make, our butterfly wings will heal a broken world. And that'll just be the start. You know, butterflies flutter their wings over and over again as they cross continents, changing the world in ways that they never even see. And so do we, if we choose. Even in a world on fire, hope is as real as your next act of witness to the light that shines in the darkness. God's light, which the darkness cannot overcome.